Welcome, everyone. Welcome to this time of worship. What a privilege it is to be together and to study God's Word together. Welcome to the, those who are watching online, too, whenever and wherever. God bless you in that. We've come to hear the good news of the gospel and to drink it in, that God's Spirit may pour it right into our hearts. Let's ask for his blessing. Please pray with me. Lord, thank you for the good news. Thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and all his beauty, his truth and grace. We pray that you will pour out that truth and grace into our hearts. Use your servant, Dan, to that end. Grow us in the grace and the knowledge of our Savior, and then use us to be good news to this world that you so love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good evening, everyone. And thanks for being here tonight and for all of these weeks. I've certainly enjoyed my time. Anytime I get an opportunity to teach through and talk about the Gospel of John, uh, I'm grateful for it. So thank you for the invitation uh, and the opportunity to be with you on these Sunday evenings. Uh, if nothing else, uh, hopefully this time has inspired you to continue reading and studying this wonderful Gospel. I think as I mentioned the first week, uh, uh, one of the New Testament commentators, Leon Morris, compared the Gospel of John to a swimming pool. You know, uh, shallow enough that a child can wade and deep enough that an elephant can swim. So no matter who you are, you can hop in. And if, you know, some of, some of us have studied this for years, and, and it doesn't matter if you're one of the greatest, uh, most accomplished theologians, you can jump right back in and something else is revealed. And I, I know I found that for myself again, just in preparing for these times and reading through and thinking, oh, wow, that jumped out. I didn't see that before. And there's a depth, a theological depth to this gospel that is just amazing. And it continues. So thanks for the opportunity to do this. So tonight, we are in this passion narrative that John has, chapters 18 and 19, the crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, and uh, as he does throughout his gospel, he's going to take us not he's going to take us beyond just the surface level of the story, you know, of the narrative. And he's going to take us to a second level and, and a third level and maybe a fourth level. And he's going to plumb the theological depths of this event of the crucifixion of Jesus, and he does that here. So we're going to run across many of those as we go through this very familiar story in Jesus' crucifixion. So if you were here last week, we, we, we talked about the arrest of Jesus, the Jewish trial, and then the Roman trial before Pontius Pilate. Unfortunately, we cut it a bit short last week. Sorry about that. We didn't quite finish that. But the, the theme, that, the overall theme that John wants to emphasize in this passion narrative, really two things. And, and, and first is the control of Jesus. He is in complete control. He is not a victim. He is not frenzied, of course. Uh, there is no agony in the garden. There is no kiss of betrayal. Jesus is in control, orchestrating this whole thing. And everyone is doing exactly what they're supposed to do. I am the good shepherd, he said. I lay down my life. I lay it down. Nobody takes it from me. So this is a very obviously purposeful death, orchestrated, and everything is going exactly as planned. So Jesus is in complete control, right? Uh, the other thing that John wants to emphasize in this passion narrative and in the crucifixion is the kingship of Jesus. He is the king. And, and uh, John continues in this narrative to probe the divine identity of who Jesus is. That's we've seen, well, all the way through the gospel, John does that. But here he does it again, uh, talking about king and kingship. And we didn't get to this maybe last week, but Pilate says, so are you a king? Are you a king, Jesus? And Jesus says, well, 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 yes, but my kingdom is not of this world. So it's a whole different kind of, it's not a political kingdom, it's not a human kingdom, it's not a military kingdom, that's not the thing, it's a different kingdom, but you bet, I'm a king. And then Jesus says, for this reason, I was born and I came into the world. Now, we just skip over that. 
I was born, Jesus says. I think that goes to his human identity, right? He was born as a human of a woman, like we all were. But yet, he also came into the world as the only begotten Son of the Father. And this is God himself moving into our reality. So Jesus, for this reason, I was born. And I came from above to accomplish this purpose, right? Uh, so Jesus is a king. And his kingship is proclaimed, of course, in that ironic sort of middle scene in the trial with Pilate where Jesus is ironically right, proclaimed as king with the robe and the thorns and the, the mocking, right, meant to demean Jesus, but nevertheless, he's proclaimed as king. So, so this is a story about the king and the return of King uh, Jesus to heaven. There's a couple of more things I just want to preview as we, before we get started, just so that you can look for them as they come. Two other things are going to really stick out in this, uh, in this crucifixion scene, uh, and that is uh, the role of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you go all the way through John, you could do a whole theology of water in the Gospel of John. Water comes up all the time, and water is symbolic of a lot of things, right? Purification, refreshment, all of that living water. So, uh, but water comes to be associated with the Holy Spirit. Who brings that renewal? Who brings that cleansing, right? Who brings in that new life, right? And so Jesus is offering living water. And here, uh, uh, really, in the Gospel of John, it is the crucifixion that's the high point. It's the high point. I mean, there's the resurrection, of course, and Jesus does victoriously rise from the dead. But for John, it's the crucifixion. It is finished, says Jesus in John. And what's finished is the pouring out or the giving over, the handing over, literally, of that Holy Spirit. This is it. This is what I came for, to give this Holy Spirit as living water so that these men and women can be new humans and transformed with new life. Does that make sense? So we're going to see the role of the Holy Spirit here. It's coming up. Uh, and the other thing that you want to be on the lookout for, and we'll get to this, uh, there is a temple theology in this Gospel of John. Obviously, Jesus himself is the temple, right? Destroy this temple, I'll rebuild it, this is my body, and so on. Jesus is the new focus of the presence of God. But it goes further in this crucifixion scene. Jesus is creating or shall we even say, giving birth to Mary, the mother of Jesus, plays a role here as well, symbolically, giving birth to, shall we say, a new temple, a new community of disciples in whom resides the presence of God that is now born to the whole rest of the world. Does that make sense? So this spirit who transforms and is the presence of Jesus and then this new temple, this new community of people is being birthed at the cross. So those are some of the theological things that we want to be on the lookout for. Are we ready? Okay, we're more than ready. So Jesus is crucified here. This is the final scene, the arrest, the Jewish trial, the Roman trial, and now the crucifixion, fourthly. So... If you're familiar with medieval depictions of the crucifixion, this is uh, pretty representative of medieval art, uh, uh, of uh, scenes of the crucifixion. And, uh, and what do you notice there? Uh, you know, the cross is it's high, right? Jesus is high and lifted up, right? Uh, the city of Jerusalem there is in the dim distance, and this is way outside the city. Uh, what do you not notice? Well, uh, crucifixions were, were the most, uh, Josephus said, the most wretched way to die. And what you don't see is any blood. There is no blood. Uh, and there uh, certainly, just, just physically or naturally speaking, of course, in a crucifixion, there would be a lot of blood. And of course, symbolically and theologically in the Gospel of John, there is going to be blood and water flowing from the side of Jesus when that spear is thrust in. So, so we just have to be aware of some of the depictions in art and then what maybe really happened and theologically is taking place. So here we go. Here's the text. 
So the soldiers took charge of Jesus and carrying his own cross, says John, no Simon of Cyrene here to help Jesus. Jesus does it himself, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull. That, that verb, that Greek verb behind he went out is the same verb at the arrest, remember in the garden? And Jesus went out and said, who is it you are looking for? Remember Jesus stepped forward? So this is, this is Jesus, he went out, stepping forward. He is going to the cross consciously and purposefully, and, and that's reflected, I think, in this verb. So he's crucified there with two others. They're not called criminals, as they are in Luke. Uh, this is Jesus, as we said, royal entourage, his royal escort as he is enthroned on the cross. That's the scene that John wants us to, to see. And then here's Pilate, uh, has the notice fastened to the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. There it is again. In this tragic scene, Jesus is proclaimed as the King of the world. And there you have it. So his, this is the King uh, who's dying on the cross. So... Uh, just to uh, set the historical scene here and some of the movements of Jesus, uh, this is, I mean, it's a little hard to see here, but uh, the Temple Mount area, this is Jerusalem. And so uh, we said that the, uh, the uh, Roman trial of Jesus could have taken place in one of two places. Remember, uh, one of them was this Antonia Fortress, which is right here. That's the traditional location and, and the place where you will be taken if you're going to walk the Via Dolorosa in Jerusalem. It'll start at the Antonia Fortress. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm becoming more convinced by some of the scholarly work and other things that people, archaeologists are looking into, that really it was Pilate's uh, headquarters or the, uh, the palace that was built by Herod the Great. And then that's the place maybe where Pilate would have stayed when he came to Jerusalem. I think I mentioned that last week. So if that's the place, then Jesus carries his own cross really not very far, not very far, so inside the wall and then outside the wall here to Golgotha, which is just, as you see, outside the wall, not very far away, just barely outside the wall, all right? So that's probably, uh, you know, what, what historically happened. And there you see a little bit better picture of that Temple Mount, beautiful, huge Temple Mount, again, built by Herod the Great, that huge temple just before the birth of Jesus, uh, and then the wall of the city right here, and then Golgotha, the place of crucifixion just outside. You can see the proximity to the town. It's very close. This is all very close, everybody. This is not, you know, on a hill far away stood an old... No, probably not. It's probably very close uh, to the city of Jerusalem. Uh, if you do go to Jerusalem these days, there are two sites that they suggest, again, as the crucifixion location. One of them is this place, the place of the skull, and you can see it's right near a, 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 an Arab bus station right, right down here. But the place of the skull, you can, you can make out, you can see why they call it the place of the skull. So that, that gives rise to, oh, aha, that looks like a skull. Golgotha, the place of the skull, that must be it. Uh, but uh, again, I, I, I don't think that actually is the location. I think most of the evidence, almost all of the evidence, points in the, in the direction of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre being the actual location. So if you go to Jerusalem today, uh, you can visit the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The, the physical structure that you see there was, uh, uh, is remains from Crusader times. So that's uh, about 1000 AD, 1100 AD. Uh, that physical structure. Of course, the church has been built and sort of rebuilt. And uh, it actually, you can trace the history of Christians meeting at this location all the way back to the first century. So there's some good evidence that suggests this is the spot where Jesus crucified. So a church was built over this location. You see it there. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's the location both of Jesus' crucifixion and his burial and, and resurrection. So if you go inside that church, well, there's the doorway. Uh, have some of you been there? You, some of you have been there, right, and visited, okay? And you can go in the doorway there, and you turn immediately to the, well, there's the doorway again with folks going in uh, from all over the world, by the way, right? There are Christians all over the world who come to this place, to this place, really sort of considered to be the holiest site in Christianity, right? So uh, 
people come there. There you see it. Uh, if you go in and take an immediate turn to the right and go up the stairs, there's a very ornate altar here, uh, and there's a zoom in on it. Uh, where people can go and you can stand in line and you can take your turn to go. Oops, I don't have it there, but you can go and take your turn and you can reach your hand through a hole in the floor and apparently touch the rock beneath the, the structure there. So I don't know if that's the exact location, but, but it is in the area. As I said a few weeks ago, it's a bit of a bittersweet experience because I think it is the location. It is in the area. And yet, what is going on there, the division, the disunity that happens there, uh, the ritualism that occurs, it really is what Jesus came to overcome in all of this and not, yeah. Uh, and there would be the tomb just in the same building, in the same structure, just on the other side is this uh, edicule, they call it, uh, this structure here. And again, you can wait in line and you can go into this very ornate tomb. Again, not the actual tomb, not the actual tomb, but nevertheless, it's, it commemorates the, uh, the resurrection of Jesus. And there you see people waiting in line, sort of as if they were at Disneyland, waiting to go into the, to the tomb of Jesus. You get to, uh, uh, I think I did it once and, and I'm not doing it anymore. It's just, I don't, I don't need to do that. I'd rather, if you go, uh, there, there, are, there are caves and stairways that go down underneath, and you can actually see first century rock-hewn tombs in the sort of the bowels of this building. And I like to take my students down there, and it's dark, and it just, it's just more realistic, and we, we, we get, it's more moving to do that. So this is a, a, this is a model, a miniature model of Jerusalem in Jesus' day. So there again, that temple mount built by Herod the Great, the temple itself. Here's the wall of Jerusalem. That would have been the wall in the first century. It expanded after the first century out to here. So there's a second wall. But in the first century, this was the wall. And this is the place of Golgotha or the place of the crucifixion. You can see again, it's proximity to the temple. It's right here. Right? And Jesus is dying on Passover weekend. And John certainly wants to, he wants to recall Passover language and Passover symbols for Jesus' death. This is very important to him, and we'll see it. And so Jerusalem would have been jam-packed, probably with several hundred thousand people, all buying lambs and celebrating Passover and recalling the exodus and the, the liberation from slavery and oppression and the movement towards a promised land that God had planned for them. So they're all recalling this and thinking about this and telling the story. And there is Jesus as, as uh, John the Baptist referred to him in the first chapter, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So it's just all happening on that weekend in this busy, busy city of Jerusalem. Uh, this location, there it is again, zooming in, uh, uh, was an abandoned stone quarry. You know, uh, uh, stones would be quarried to use in construction for buildings, and this one had been used up, and so now it's sort of an abandoned stone quarry. And we have evidence that this was a place of quite some many crucifixions, not just Jesus and the two crucified that day. But this was a location where the Romans would frequently uh, sort of uh, engage in crucifixion and all of that. So uh, there it is just outside the city. You can see, you can see this is not a hill far away, you know, on an old rugged cross. Uh, it actually is a bit of a, of a, of a depression. Not a hill, but because it's a, an abandoned stone quarry, it's a bit of a depression. Right? And so the crosses will be placed there. You can, see the, you can see the sidewalk right here and the wall and an entrance inside and, and the temple right here. And there it is. There it is. And so you could be walking by, you know, and it would be rather this close. And you would be at eye level and just looking. And, of course, you know, this is a place where many crucifixions had taken place. So you say, well, well, Romans got another one. They got another one. Oh, well. And so people would walk by and see it uh, that closely. And there it is. Uh, there is, uh, we have evidence from some of the first century crucifixions of uh, uh, 
uh, uh, bones, ankle bones and, and wrist bones that have been discovered from first century crucifixions. Uh, you know, the nails were probably not driven through the palm, but rather right through the, through the wrist here. And the Romans, I mean, there were Roman crucifixion squads and they, their only job was to, was to do, do crucifixions. And the Romans had perfected this. They knew exactly how to crucify somebody and uh, elicit the most amount of pain and suffering over the longest amount of time. And, and often these victims would linger for days, four days, five days, a week, and of course the blood and then the, you know, the birds and the vultures and the smell of death and blood and plucking. I, I mean, it's just, it's awful. And as Josephus said, this is the most wretched way to die. This is what the Romans did to Jesus. And it would sever the median nerve, probably, and, and it, would, it, it wouldn't have a great amount of blood loss because you wouldn't want that, right? You want the victim to stay alive and writhing over a long time. So place the, the, the nail probably there. And here you see a first century uh, ankle bone with the nail, again, probably not driven through the top of the foot, but rather sideways through the ankle like that. Uh, and there you see it. And this is just a drawing of, uh, of, a, of a crucifixion. And as you might know, uh, the, the cause of death is not the nailing of the victim, but the, the, the cause of death, medically speaking, would be asphyxi asphyxiation or uh, shock or something like that. The, you know, the victim would be placed and the knees bent and arms like this, and, 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 and you would have to, in order to breathe, you would have to push yourself up to get air into your lungs. So, well, pretty soon the legs can't bear the weight. So the weight then shifts where? To the shoulders and the arms. And they say that there could be dislocation of an elbow a joint and a shoulder joint and the arms could elongate as much as nine inches. And so now the, the weight is transferred to the rib cage, and now the victim is desperate, you know, right? <clears throat> and pretty soon you can't push yourself up anymore, and you just, it's just, just, yeah. So this is what the Romans were doing to Jesus. But again, that's the historical facts which we, we, we know. John now wants to probe some of the theological symbolism involved in this whole thing. So let's think about that for a minute, okay? Uh, the, the next significant thing that occurs, uh, again, theologically, is the division of the clothing. Again, only John has this. By the way, the things that I'm pointing out here uh, are only in the Gospel of John. Now, obviously, the crucifixion, the nails, the going out to the site, that's in the synoptics. But now these theological uh, sort of elements of the story are found only in John. So the first one is the seamless uh, garment, the division of clothing. So the soldiers divided up the clothes and then the, this garment was seamless, woven in one uh, piece and they did not tear it. So they didn't tear this single sort of piece, uh, garment. Now why? I mean, what's going on? You go, oh, well, well why did they do that? Well, I think John, John does, you know, he has this symbolism. And he wants to give us insight. So first of all, he said that this happened that scripture might be fulfilled. So John has that actually several times in this uh, passion narrative. So that scripture might be fulfilled. So that scripture might be fulfilled. So that scripture, right? This is a purposeful, planned, missional death. Planned from the Old Testament. Well, from the foundations of the world, right? Uh, and so there you can see the quote is from Psalm 22 which, by the way, Jesus quoted on the cross as well from the beginning, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So from that same psalm. So, so on, the one, on, on one level, it's so that scripture might be fulfilled, that they didn't divide the, 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 uh, the, that seamless garment. It was seamless. So that's good. But I think there's something else. This would, for Jewish people, recall the vestment worn by the high priest. And here's how Josephus, the first century historian, describes this priestly garment. He says, now this garment was not composed of two pieces, nor was it sewn together upon the shoulders and sides, but it was one long vestment so woven as to have an opening for the neck. So what might John be doing here? 
I, I think maybe, just maybe, he's alluding to the fact that this is Jesus' priestly work, acting now as a high priest, making the sacrifice. Not only the lamb of God, you know, given for the sins of God, but now the high priest. And of course, Paul and others in the New Testament will develop that priestly function of Jesus. John doesn't necessarily do that here, but I think nevertheless, maybe a reference to this priestly role of Jesus as well as the Lamb. So there you have it. I mean, just, just a thing like that has some theological symbolism and depth. Now here's the one that I really want to talk about. I, I alluded to earlier that maybe what John is trying to show here is this birth of a new temple this birth of a new household, of a new community of people in which the Spirit of God and Christ dwells and lives, right? And so here we have this scene between, well, Jesus, his mother there, Mary is there, and John, the disciple, the author of this gospel is there. So the three of them, I mentioned this last week, very, I mean, there are echoes of Genesis, aren't there? A man and a woman in a garden, and notice, Mary is not called Mary. She is only in this scene called woman or mother. Woman and mother. Uh, and that's, I think, going to have a symbolic role in all of this. So here's the scene. And by the way, this is only in John, of course. And here's the, the text. So near the cross stood his mother, mother, his mother's sister Mary and Mary Magdalene, when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, so that's John, our author, standing nearby, he said to her, here it is, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Now, on the surface level, what's going on, do you think? And maybe you've heard this or read this or thought about this. Well, on the surface level, what's happening? Well, this seems to be a son providing for the care of his mother before his death, right? So here's John, perhaps Jesus' cousin, and maybe that's why the relationship here, take care of my mother. So on the surface level, this is Jesus caring for his family, caring for his mother, and, and committing his mother into the care of maybe his cousin John. So that's the surface level. And maybe that's so. But of course, for the Gospel of John, he wants to take us another level down, and another level down, and even another level down. So pay attention here. You're going to need your thinking caps for this section. Okay? So here we, here we go. The first thing I would just want to say about this scene is that uh, it recalls the first sign in Cana. Remember the wedding scene and the water to wine? And there, Mary is present again, right? And she is called woman and mother in that scene. And here it is again. And John uh, 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 intentionally calls that wedding feast. Remember, this is the first sign that Jesus performed, the first sign. And now we have here this, well, eighth and final and climactic sign of the crucifixion. And some of the similarities, so we had a first sign and a last sign, and we have the presence of water and wine and the hour. Remember Jesus says to his mother in chapter 2, woman, my hour has not yet come. And that anticipates the hour which is now happening, right? So we've got the hour and the blood and the wine and the water and so on. This is the great hour of Jesus. So I think there are there's a relationship between that sign and so on. And I won't go through all of that and read all of that, but uh, many have done uh, uh, investigations into this. But what was at the bottom there, what was foreshadowed at Cana became reality at the cross. And so John sort of has bookends. The first sign, woman and mother, water, wine, and the hour, and now it's becoming red. Jesus is... Is, is providing the means of purification and renewal and life as he promised and symbolized at that first sign. Uh, there's this verse in John 16. So this is the birthing now. We'll go to the next level. Go to the next level. So surface level, right? Providing for his mother. The next level, you know, maybe the association with Cana and the hour and all of that. And now we'll take it down another level to, the, to so this birthing 
language. And this is, this is in Jesus' uh, upper room discourse with his disciples the night before his death. And he's talking about, he talks actually an awful lot about the Holy Spirit. In John 14 and 15 and, and 16. And here he mentions in, in, in 16, 21, a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. And, and, and ladies, you know what that means, right? You've, some of you have gone through that and know the pain and the joy. And so Jesus, I think, here is talking symbolically or theologically about the birthing of a new temple, of a new household, of a new family. And there's anguish and there's pain, right, as, as there is in a birth. But, but then there's the joy of the new community and of the new life that emerges and results. So I think we have this birthing language that Jesus uses to talk about what he's going to do right here in the Gospel of John. Well, how does that get developed? Well, uh, this isn't actually unique to me, so I must give credit to this, uh, this woman here, Mary Colo, at the Australian Catholic University who has written on this. And, and so a lot of what I'm going to say is going to come out of this, but uh, she has a book entitled God Dwells With Us, and then the subtitle there is Temple Symbolism in the Fourth Gospel. And so... Let me try to summarize a little bit quickly, at least this crucifixion scene. She goes through the whole gospel, but, but just the crucifixion scene with regard to this birthing analogy and, and the temple language as well. So here's John 18.1. This is the arrest of Jesus. And I mentioned last week, there's the reference to a garden. To a garden. Uh, not the garden of Gethsemane. God doesn't say that. The synoptics say Gethsemane. John just simply says garden. So clearly, this is echoes of Genesis again, right? As he began the gospel, in the beginning was the word, and the word was, so that's an echo of Genesis. There are many more echoes of Genesis. You know, the creation, the light, the darkness, which we mentioned. And now here is the garden. So we have a garden where Jesus is now going to go for his final, final sign. Uh, and then here's John 19. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. Again, a garden, another garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one has ever been laid. So here again is another garden. But again, echoes of Genesis. Here is going to be another man and a woman in a garden and a test to be passed, right? And life to be either lived or not, right? Whoops. And here's John 19, 18. So there they crucified him with two others, one on each side, and what? Jesus in the middle. So here, if you think theologically and symbolically in these echoes of Genesis, and remember John, this, he's going beyond the surface. He's taking us down. And it, clearly you read this, you go, oh, here we have, here we have another tree in the middle of another garden. And something different is going to happen this time. And here's Genesis 2, taking this back to Genesis. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. John says, and there they crucified Jesus in the middle of the garden. You, you have to make that association. You just do, right? And, and so John is doing, doing that. So uh, at the cross now is Mary. And she is called woman and mother. Remember, the, remember what Jesus said, woman, behold your son. Son, your mother. Only in John at the cross. So she is called woman and mother, and we have Jesus in the middle, we have the woman and mother, and we have John the disciple. This is what John wants us to see in this scene. You know, here going back to that Cana, right? This is back in two. So again, we have woman. Why do you involve me? His mother said this. So we have this woman and mother language again, bookending these two signs. And then here is what I read in verse 26. Jesus saw his mother. He said to her, woman, here is your son. To the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, the disciple took her to his own. So again, woman and mother and taking her uh, to his own. And so what Jesus is doing here, as I mentioned, and I, I just, I think this is right, I think it is, 
that Jesus is building this new temple. Now, the temple, of course, is the, is the representation of the presence of God. And then Jesus becomes that representation. He's the new temple, right? Uh, he is the focus of purification and sacrifice and worship. And, of course, yeah, and then, and then uh, 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 there's this birthing of a new household, so to speak, or a new community. Now, not a physical building or a physical temple, but a household of people indwelt by the Holy Spirit of Christ who becomes the presence of God to the world, filled and empowered by his spirit. And if you, you, know, if you read through this gospel, Jesus is creating a new community of disciples who are attached to him in faith and in trust. Remember, believe into Jesus. Attach yourself into him. So remember the first chapter. Jesus came to his own, the Jews, but his own did not receive him and you read through the john and there's conflict from the jewish opponents right and eventually they cry for his crucifixion and they they go back into the darkness but the light shines and there are others but to those who receive him and believed into his name he gave them the right to become what children of god a new family with new kids and the birthing of a new community. Are you following this? This is all good. And, and so you have, as you read through, these new disciples begin coming in, right? There's two of them in the very first chapter, right? John, our author, and, and then there's, well, there's four. There's Philip and Nathaniel and John, and, well, there's Peter and Andrew, right? For five. Right, in that first chapter, and then we get the Samaritan woman. We didn't talk about her, but she becomes an example of successful discipleship. Whereas in John 3, Nicodemus is an example of failed discipleship. Although our friend Nicodemus is coming back in the scene. He's coming into the light. Don't worry. So the Samaritan woman, uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, of course, they become part of Jesus' new family, right? So there's the, he's gathering these people. And I mentioned, maybe I did, but maybe the, the hero of this Gospel of John to John's audience in Ephesus. I mean, the hero and the model of discipleship of all of them is the blind man in chapter 9. The blind man. I think I mentioned this, right? He's the one who wins a debate with the Jewish religious, this blind guy, he's blind. He's desperate, and he wins a, a theological debate with Jewish religious leaders who cling to their religion and ritual. And he gives a clear and simple testimony. I once was blind, but now I see. That's it. I'm in the light. And of course, it's all symbolic, right? The Jews are going back into the darkness, and here's a blind man going from darkness to light, and Jews supposedly going from the light of the Torah and all of that Old Testament scripture into the darkness of sin in the world. You see that? And this man, remember in John 9, gets kicked out of the synagogue. He gets kicked out. And John's audience would have said, that, guy, that guy's our hero. That guy right there. He was clear. He was courageous. He gave a testimony. He's a disciple. He followed Jesus. He won a debate with the Jewish scholars, and he got kicked out. We're going to do the same thing. And then as readers, we're going to say, yeah, we're going to do that too. We're doing that too. So building this new temple and birthing this new family, right? So here we go. Woman, here is your son. So we have a woman. So if Jesus says woman... Here is your son. Jesus creates a new relationship between Mary and John the disciple. Now it is mother and son. Do you see that? Woman, here is your son. So if Jesus creates a new mother-son relationship between these two, then, by implication, there is a new relationship between Jesus and John. They are now brothers and siblings. And that also, by implication, then creates a new relationship with God. Then this is a child of God. As Jesus is the one and only begotten of the Father, now he's giving birth to new sons and daughters who become the brothers and sisters of Christ, who become the sons and daughters of Mary and part of this new... Are you following this? This is good stuff. 
and John is doing it. You would never see this. You would never see it, right? Unless you go below the surface with John and probe this. So here it is. I mentioned, you know, in the first chapter, it takes us back to the first chapter. Yet all who did receive him to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And there it is. John is the, well, the first one, right? Mother, behold your son. There it is. Brothers and sisters, children of God. We said that already. Uh, this, this phrase to his own in verse 11, this is in the first chapter. This is the first chapter. Remember, Jesus came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who receive him, believe his name, he gave the right to become children of God. To his own, to his own. There's John 1, 11. He came to that which was his own. Then in John 19, 27, the disciple took her, same phrase, to his own. Clearly, that's bookends again. Jesus came to his own, the Jewish family, but his own did not receive him. So now this new family, uh, John... The, uh, takes her to his own. And a new family outside, shall we say, of Judaism is begun. To his own, now to his own. Does that make, I know that's a little bit of a linguistic argument there. So only in John, Jesus says, it is finished. Only in John. So you go, okay, good, it's finished. Well, what's finished? Well, well, well all of it. But most particularly this business of a new temple and a new family and a new community indwelt by the spirit who will fill it. We're still getting to the spirit, by the way. Hang in there. Still getting there. It is finished. I came to create a new temple. I was the new temple. Now I've given birth to a new family, a new household of people and community who will bear my presence to the world. It's all finished. And then it says he bowed in gave down the spirit and now we need to talk about uh, the, uh, the spirit well, well, well we'll get to the spirit in just a minute but just one on the household of God so this is, uh, this is John 20 uh, where Mary Magdalene meets Jesus in the garden remember and that morning it's Mary she doesn't recognize him and she wants to cling to him and Jesus says don't hug me and, and so on and then Jesus says to her do not hold me for I have not yet ascended to the father but go to here it is go to who my brothers and sisters a new family right a new relationship go to my brothers and sisters and say to them I am ascending to my father and your father there it is new relationships new family new temple right to my god and your god there it is in the language even of the of the resurrection all right is everybody okay did you see all that that was pretty good i, I think that's worth doing now let's go on to the next little scene we're going to keep probing the symbolism and the code language here uh, jesus dies and he says like i said it is finished which we just mentioned but another saying of Jesus, only in John, is, I am thirsty, right? I am thirsty. Well, what is that? Well, on the surface level, it's, I'm, I'm thirsty. Now, I'm in a desperate, you know, situation where I'm dying, and my body is desperate, and it's hurting, and I need fluid, and I'm thirsty. Well, that's a surface. But then again, John wants to take us, take us further. So, here's the text. Knowing, again, Jesus' foreknowledge. Knowing that everything had now been finished. This whole thing about the temple and all that. And so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Uh, and and, and to, again, to fulfill scripture, there you can see the quotes is from Psalm 69, uh, and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Uh, so on the one hand, Jesus is thirsty, but on the other hand, food and drink in John sort of represents Jesus' desire to accomplish the mission from the Father right? It just does. And in the garden at his arrest in John 18, 11, remember when Peter slices the, the ear and Jesus says, put your sword away. And then he says, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? So when Jesus says, I'm thirsty, it's, yeah, it's not just I'm thirsty, but I, I, I desire to accomplish this mission. I'm going to embrace this. I'm going to do it. I'm going to fulfill it. 
I'm thirsty. I almost, I'm not going to say that Jesus relishes the cross, and, but, but although the author of Hebrews does say, for the joy set before him, he endured the scorn and the shame and went through it, right? So I think Jesus knows what's going on here and he embraces it. I'm thirsty. I'm ready to do this. I'm ready to empty myself. I'm giving you a preview here. I'm ready to empty myself of that water and spirit and let it flow to the world. And I think in this case, Jesus senses that emptying of the spirit and the flow of life from him to the world and to us. Does that make sense? So I'm thirsty and it is finished. Uh, some Passover language. Here is Exodus 12, right? The Passover instructions, and they were to take a bunch of hyssop and dip it into the blood to put the blood on the door frame. Uh, and here we have John mentions, only John mentions the hyssop plant, that it was a stalk of hyssop plant lifted to Jesus' lips. Any Jew reading that would go, wait a second, we know what hyssop is for. That's to be used to dip into the blood and put it on the door frame in the Passover celebration. So you see, John wants us to recall that and to Jesus as the Passover lamb. And here's Hebrews 9.19. Uh, when Moses proclaimed every command of the law of the people, he took the blood of the calves together with water, scarlet wool, branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll on all the people. So here we have blood, water, and hyssop. And in the crucifixion scene in John, we're going to get blood, water, and hyssop. All right? Okay, we, we've done the it is finished thing. We'll, we'll, we, we've done that. So let's, let's go on. So in verse 30, there in the, in the last verse, verse 30, I am, I am thirsty, it is finished. In verse 30, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So again, on the surface level, it could be, well, he, he, he died. <laughs> he gave up his spirit. And he, he, he's dead. But I, I, some of you can read Greek, and you guys got this in Greek. Okay, no, maybe not. Uh, but the, the verb is paradokain, ta numa. That last phrase, I'm just reading that right there. He handed over the spirit. Now that's a verb that's used when you talk about handing something over to a successor. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing. He's handing over not, well, his spirit, but he's handing over the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God, which indwelt him, which he came to this earth with, right? And he says, I'm now going to hand that over to the successor. And the successor, of course, is this new family, this new church, this new community who bears his presence and now his spirit, all right? And that's what he's, he's doing there. And then this flow of blood and water, the signs of life and the spirit that we've been talking about here, which brings life. Uh, so here uh, in John 30, uh, 9, 31, uh, 31 to 33, they came to him and they broke the legs of the criminals, but they, last verse there, they came to Jesus, found he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Now, that, that again is Passover. Passover language and Passover assembly because one of the rules with the Passover lamb is, is, is don't break the legs, right? The way, that you, the way that you kill the animal is to slit the throat and there's a flow of blood and that's the way the animal expires, right? And you don't break the legs and so on. And here you see Exodus 12, 46, do not break any of the bones. So again, Jesus, John wants us to see Jesus as the Passover lamb. This is Passover. Hyssop, water, blood, not breaking the legs. This is all new exodus. This is new life. This is a new adventure. This is a new promised land. This is a new family of people, right? And all of that. He, Jesus is delivering you from your exile. Your, you know, and your real exile, your meta, metaphorical exile and all of that. And here then going on, uh, they pierce the side of Jesus, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. And again, these things happen that scripture might be fulfilled. And there's the quote from Zechariah. They will look on the one they have pierced. So they pierced him, the flow of blood and water. So again, this is scripture fulfillment. This is intentional and purposeful, right? But here's the Passover symbolism, right? The, 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 uh, the blood must flow. The rabbis would, you know, or, or when, you, when you brought your lamb to be killed for the Passover, uh, you know, there, there would need to be a flow of blood, 
as a sign of that the animal is dead and the life is being given, right? Uh, the first covenant, as we observed, involved bl blood, water, and hyssop. Moses' uh, rock gave water and life. And here Jesus in the Spirit, we've got, with you must, John 3, Nicodemus, you must be bl born of the water and the Spirit. It's new birth there, right? John 4, I will, if you knew who it was who was, you were talking to, I would offer you living water. Samaritan woman. And then John 7, which we did a few weeks ago, right? At the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus said, if anybody is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And John says, by this he meant his spirit, the Holy Spirit, who he was yet to give, right? So all of that is going on with the Spirit now here in Zechariah, talking about that Messiah and that new life that God would ultimately bring on that day, on the day of renewal and transformation, a fountain will be opened. Again, in verse 8, 14, on that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem. I didn't put up Ezekiel 47 again. Remember the river and, the, and coming out of the temple. Well, what's happening, people? Blood and water flowing from Jesus' side. You know, the, the Jews talked about the renewal that God would bring as water flowing out of the temple. What's happening? Water is flowing out of the temple. The temple of Jesus' body. To the world and the renewal is happening just as they expected and there's that hebrews 9 passage again so he gave over his spirit handed it over the sudden flow of blood and water uh, remember back in john 7 maybe I, I forget if i said this or not whoever believes in me as scripture has said rivers of living water will flow from within them well the grammar is a bit tricky and it could also equally be rivers of living water will flow from within him by this he meant the Spirit. I think maybe the best way, the correct way to understand the grammar in John 7 is that the rivers of living water will flow from Jesus, from him. And now it's happening at the cross. Isn't this? So Jesus is giving the Spirit, the renewal, the life, the living water that he promised, the transformation that he gives, symbolized all the way through, and now it's happening, the high point. So Jesus not mere, he doesn't merely offer salvation, but transformation, renewal in life. See, John does not so much emphasize atonement theology. You know, that the, the atonement and the dying for sins and, 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 and the forgiveness of sins and, and all that. And obviously, Luke does that. Paul talks about atonement and justification and, and, and uh, you know, substitutionary atonement and so on. Obviously, that's part of the, the work of the cross. But John does not emphasize that part. If you read through this gospel, he is emphasizing the new life part shall we say sanctification if you want to use the doctrinal term so paul talks about justification well john talks about sanctification you get this new life this renewed life this transformed life and when does that life start by the way eternal life eternal life in john is now not this future ethereal platonic bodiless existence someday it's new life, new creation, renewed humans right now. That's eternal life, right? And so John in Jesus at the cross is offering this life. New humans, new husbands, new wives, new children, new teachers, new employers, new employees, a whole new way of doing life and living in a whole new realm and a whole new family filled with the spirit of Christ. Does that make sense? This is good stuff. All right, can you hang? We got about 10, can you hang for about 10 minutes? It's my last time, so I'm going to stay for 10 more minutes and then leave and not come back. So you can stay. But, so 10 more minutes. The burial of Jesus. Here comes Nicodemus. He's back. He's back. And he's going to become a disciple of Jesus and a follower. He is going to emerge from the darkness that we saw him in in chapter 3. He came out a little bit in chapter 7. If you read that in chapter 7, Nicodemus was the one who stood up and said, hey, wait a minute, shouldn't we have a real trial here before we kill him? And then here, Nicodemus is going to come into the bright light, along, of course, with Joseph of Arimathea. And so Jesus is buried. So Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body. Verse 39, he was accompanied by Nicodemus, who had earlier visited Jesus at 
night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, they wrapped it with the spices and so on. Verse 41, the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Uh, this, what is this burial? This burial scene here, who is being buried here? Well, Jesus, but with the spices and the garden and the new tomb, which no one had ever been laid in and wrapped in linen. What kind of person gets buried like that? A king. A rich person. A king. This is the burial. John is showing us the burial of a king. Uh, you know who got buried similar to this? Herod the Great. Herod the Great, who had died some 30 years before. Jesus did, but uh, as some of you have been to Israel, maybe you visited the Herodian and been there. It's awesome, but in, just in the last 10 years, they have positively, I think, identified the burial place of Herod the Great at the Herodian, which is just outside of Bethlehem in the Judean wilderness there. And there is this, you can see, this is the site. This is the site. This, this uh, artificial mountain, volcano shaped mountain that Herod the Great had built at the top of it, a palace, a lower palace at the bottom. You see here and then up here. And then you see here it is. And then here is this mausoleum about halfway up the mountain that archaeologists have discovered. And here you see sort of a drawing of it with the lower palace and the pools and, and the upper, this is, this is a may, I can't describe this right now. And then this stairway and halfway up the mausoleum where archaeologists have discovered this ornate sarcophagus, flesh eater, where people put bodies and they decompose. Uh, and, and this... And just putting things together from Josephus, uh, who describes a funeral procession that went that started in Jericho, where Herod the Great died, and it took 500 servants, says Josephus, to carry the spices for Herod the Great. Now, Josephus doesn't tell us exactly where they ended up, but now I think we know it's at the Herodian. And they went from Jericho to the Herodian, burying the spices, burying a king in this ornate mausoleum. This is what's happening in John. Jesus is being buried as a king, right? Uh, and here's the progression of Nicodemus. Remember chapter 3, how can this be? He's in darkness. John 7, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's been doing? He kind of comes to the defense of Jesus, and now here we have him in John 19. Joseph of Arimathea was accompanied by Nicodemus. Nicodemus has become a public follower and disciple of Jesus. He has stepped into the light. Along with Lazarus and Mary and Martha and the blind man and the Samaritan woman, and John the disciple and others, see that? And all those who receive and believe in his name and are children of God. Jesus said in chapter 12, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Yes, all kinds of people, including people like Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman and the blind man and you and me. So that's the crucifixion scene. Uh, maybe you never saw some of those little theological subtleties below the surface. But there they are, and John wants us to see them. And so we have. Let me just conclude with this five minutes, and then we'll, we'll go tonight. Uh, there is a chapter 21. I'm not going to go through the whole chapter, but this seems to be a bit of an epilogue. Uh, the very end of the gospel probably being written by disciples of John, the disciple, our author, and then finally put together by that community in Ephesus. But here's one final testimony, one final evidence. Here's John 21, the very end of this gospel, the very end. This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know his testimony is true. Well, that's a reference to John the disciple, right? John the disciple, now being spoken of in the third person, probably by these other disciples who are writing the end here. But John the disciple, the apostle, is the last in a long, long line of witnesses going all the way back to Moses and all the way through the Old Testament. All these witnesses 
finally John the Baptist, right? The sort of final witness, but it turns out maybe the, the penultimate witness because here John is described as the final, final witness. And what's his evidence that he puts forth? Well, here it is. It has become this gospel. It has become this gospel of John. The seven signs revealing the identity of Jesus. The seven I am sayings further revealing the identity of Jesus. The Holy Spirit theology, the passion narrative, all of it, all of this evidence that John brings forth. And remember he says, I wrote these things so that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that you may continue to believe in him and receive life. That's the purpose statement, remember? And this has become uh, the gospel. Uh, we, I, I didn't refer to this. There's that other scene in John 21 with Peter. Remember where we have the restoration of Peter, the three times denial, and then the three times restoration. Peter, do you love me? Okay, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Okay, then feed my sheep. Do you love me? Then feed my sheep, right? And here's a quote from uh, uh, Bruce Milne uh, from his commentary on John. He says, uh, thus the ministries of John and Peter, these two characters who show up in the last chapter, these ministries of John and Peter would be different. Peter would be the shepherd, John the seer, Peter the preacher, John the penman, Peter the foundational witness, John the faithful writer. Peter would die in the agony and passion of martyrdom. John would live on to a great age and pass away in quiet serenity. Two men, two roles, two ministries, two destinies, Peter and John. I would say that Peter is the pastor and John is the theologian, the academic. Peter, feed my sheep, care for my sheep, pastor my church. John, write maybe the most theologically deep story of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, and present the evidence with the theological symbolism and signs. You do it. Peter and John. We need both, right? We need both. The church needs both. Pastor, theologian. And then uh, those other two metaphors in the final chapter, remember it was uh, uh, Jesus appears in the boat, says throw your net on the other side and you'll catch more fish. And then they amazingly caught 153. That's for another day. We'll talk about 153 some other day. But catch the fish and then feed my sheep. These two metaphors I think also refer to the two ministries of the church, right? Fish, evangelism, outreach, going out, inviting people into discipleship and faith in Jesus, right? Catching fish, so to speak, and then shepherding and discipling and growing people up in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. Fishing and shepherding, the two tasks of the church. All right, two, I know I'm over, but it's my last time. So there's the supposed Shroud of Turin, right? And it has received, you know, sort of a lot of attention in the news, even, well, not so recently, but over the years, right? The Shroud, right? The so-called cloth that covered Jesus' face. And is it genuine? Is it authentic? Is it real? Is it the cloth? And, you know, there are a lot of people who are very enamored with things like relics and artifacts and, and physical proof and did Jesus die? Is this the shroud? Did it really happen? If we can prove it, it happened. If it's a fake, then Christianity's debunked. Are you following me? And people put a lot of stock in these relics and artifacts and, and so on. And, you know, there it is. Is it? Is that the image of Jesus on the shroud? I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. You know, people look to these things as the greatest, as witnesses to whether it happened. Do you know what the greatest witness is? Do you know what the greatest witness is to the story? Well, it's this Gospel of John, which we just read and studied for these weeks. But you know what it is, really is? It's the new community. Birthed by our Lord at the cross, filled with His Spirit, His very presence, empowered by that spirit to go out in evangelism and discipleship. And we bear his presence to our jobs, 
into the community and in our families and to the soccer fields and volleyball courts and businesses where we, what we work and we bear that presence. We are the witnesses. We are the very best witnesses to the veracity and truthfulness of this story. And John says, blessed are those who have seen and believed, but more blessed are those who have not seen and attach themselves to Jesus. That's us. And he's thinking about us as the next witnesses. So let's go out uh, and be that. And so in the book of Acts, we will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to be witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so we will do it as best we can and in the power of the Spirit, to the glory, to the glory of King Jesus. I owe you five minutes. You know, I tell my students that, and then I say, you'll never get it back. So, you know, I didn't leave time for questions. If you want to email me or questions, I know we, we have other things to do now tonight, so I want to be aware of time. But uh, thank you again uh, for allowing me to be here and for being so attentive and and, and, uh, and just good students of God's word. Thank you. So why don't we stand, have a closing prayer, and then we can, we can go our way tonight. God, our Heavenly Father, King and Lord of the universe, King Jesus, Spirit of Christ, we thank you for this Gospel of John. We thank you for the signs, for the evidence, for what it communicates to us about your identity, Jesus, what you came to offer us in terms of living water and transform lives. And so help us to continue to be students of yours, of your word, and good disciples and learners. Help us to be faithful witnesses as we now bear evidence to what you have done in and with and through us by your spirit, the new life you have brought to us. Uh, as we go to our jobs and as we interact with people and our families, may we represent Jesus really, really well. So now send us out with your blessing, with your peace, and with your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Go in peace.